and welcome to Connect, Engage, Collaborate, a podcast brought to you by the Tempe Police Department. I'm your host, Patricia Ramirez, and today I'm joined by a panel of guests. Can you please start off by introducing yourself and telling us a, a little bit about your story? I'm Brad Hollingsworth. I'm the uh, wellness coordinator for the Tempe Police Department. Uh, m- my background is I was in the Marine Corps for several years, uh, got out and got into the health and wellness space, uh, started working as a human performance, um, coach for the DOD and recently moved here to Tempe, uh, early this year and found a job with the police department. And now I'm working here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm glad you're here with our family. And can you please introduce yourself? Um, I am Lindsay McCall Long. I am a retired officer from Tempe PD. I had a total of 17 years in law enforcement. And um, <clears throat> I am a part of the peer support team here at Tempe. I still volunteer and I do some volunteer work with a couple of other agencies outside of Tempe as far as peer support goes as well. And do you mind, Lindsay, sharing what inspired you as a female woman of color to come into law enforcement? Well, I was kind of talking about this this morning. (laughs) I went to college and I did major in criminal justice. And it's funny because I get asked a lot, like, is that what you wanted to be ever since you were a little kid? And I used to lie and tell people yes, but that wasn't the truth. Honestly, I needed a job after I graduated from college. and. I got hired at the first department that I applied at, which is where I lived back in Georgia. And when I got into it, I really enjoyed it because I'm one of those people who naturally enjoys helping people. And I'm a talker. So you get to talk to people every single day. You You get to be involved in something. You're not stuck at a desk. And the county that I worked in was majority white at the time. And it, it was a good fit for me because our county was becoming more, you know, we had a lot more people moving there at a time. We had a construction boom. So we had a little bit of everybody living there. And it was nice for me because people would see me and like, oh, well, you look different. You're not the normal officer that we're used to uh, uh, responding to our calls here. And so I think being young and being female, it added to almost like a little sister effect for some people. So it was easier to get people to talk to me. And it was just kind of nice being in that environment, but I had a whole bunch of big brothers too Mm -hmm. at at the same Mm -hmm. time. And so I never had a problem internally. I ran into a couple of problems on the street, just culturally, how women are viewed in different cultures. But I was, I learned early how to work through that and remember not to take things so personally, because it's real easy to do that when you're a young officer. And have times changed for uh, women in law enforcement from from the start to where we are today? I would say overall, it, it, it has changed and it's going in a good direction. Obviously, there's still some changes we still need to make, but I do see more females in law enforcement, which is great. Um, I love some of the initiatives like 30 by 30, trying to get more females in leadership. I think sometimes where we fail, and when I say we, I think some of the female officers is we need to learn to be nicer to each other internally. And that doesn't always happen. We can kind of be crabs in the barrel when it comes to each other. And, oh, well, look what she got and kind of nitpicky. And that doesn't really help what we're here to do. Um, If you have a group of people who want to improve their numbers and just want to have more of a sisterhood, we we have to act like that. We can't see each other in the hallway and like, look at like we're in high school. Yes. You know, and then say things about that same female if a male officer takes her under his wing. It, 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 it shouldn't work like that. We just, we, you know, we talk about being inclusive and we have to be inclusive if that's Absolutely. what it's going to be. Absolutely. And Brad, I wanted to go back to you and so in your experience. So you were in the military, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was in the Marine Corps. And can you tell me a little bit of, well, what inspired you to go into the military? You know, I honestly don't know. Uh, it, it's probably a little cliche, but I truthfully, like from the time I was this big, wanted like my whole bookshelf as a child was all books on World War II and war and things like that. Um, so it, it really as far back as I can remember, it's what I wanted to do. Um, my parents, not so much. Uh, when I, you know, came senior in high school, came time to start applying for colleges. It's like December and I haven't applied to a single school and they're like, you know, 
what are you going to do? And I was like, oh, I'm going to join the military. And you could hear a pin drop in the house. They, it was like, what? No, you're going to college. Um, so that took some, some working. I ended up dig, I ended up going to college, uh, on an ROTC scholarship that didn't work out. I dropped out and enlisted and went, went into the military that way. Thank you for sharing that. And some of those experiences, would you say, come into play today, coming to the city of Tempe to the police department? Absolutely. Um, while I'm not an officer, um, my position in the wellness coordinator, and I'm also the peer sport team coordinator. Uh, a lot of my experiences, uh, I did spend a combat deployment in Afghanistan. A lot of my experiences there and some of the traumas and, you know, violent encounters and things like that really have helped give me a perspective on what some of the officers deal with um, out on the street here. And it gives me, I think, a little bit more of a position to relate to a lot of our officers um, as compared to someone else who may not have those same experiences that was also not a uh, law enforcement officer. Thank you both for sharing that and for the introduction. And let's go into our first direct question here. Uh, I want to ask, how does a law enforcement employee's physical health relate to their mental health? I think what we forget a lot of times is when we first come on, your sleep is disrupted. How and when you get to eat uh, is 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 up and down. And so that takes a toll on us uh, over time and just the stress. And that affects your sleep. So we know that sleep is one of the biggest things that can affect like mood and things like that. And if you're working on nights, I mean, when do you ever see the sun? And we forget how much we need the sun. You, you know, you need vitamin D and people are like, oh, well, I, I went to the doctor and my vitamin D is low. And I'm like, yeah. And what we don't realize about that is it can affect your mood. So your physical health and your mental health, they're related to one another. Absolutely. I know a lot of us can get into this profession and, oh, I chose this. And, oh, I don't need to sleep. I can sleep when I'm dead. I've, I've, I've heard all of those things, but they really are part and parcel. And you have to take care of both of them. You cannot just take care of one. Absolutely. When you sleep better, you can process information better. Your temperament is better. But if you have gone like two or three days on very little sleep, it is very easy to be irritable. And I'm saying that from experience, you know, um, even when I have peer contacts and I tell people like, listen, I'm not telling you this is what you should do because I've done everything right. I've done it very wrong <laughs> for a long time. A lot of us have, but it's all about learning and being like, oh, my goodness, having a sleep schedule as much as you can. Wow. Like I feel great in the morning or I'm ready to attack the day instead of being like, oh, another day. So I, I think that's a, a real conversation. It has to happen more often. And we have to remember you have to take care of both of those things because it affects your relationships. It reflect, reflects how you deal with the citizens on the street. And, you know, you can be seen as a horrible, just grumpy person, and that's not really who you are. And if you're not eating well, then that can lead to gut issues and heart issues and all this other stuff. So it's one of those things of where we have insurance, you know, get checked from top to bottom and make sure your health and your mental health are as much on the same page as they possibly can be. Absolutely. And I want to hear from you, uh, Brad, but what I wanted to ask Lindsay is, can you share a little bit about secondary trauma and how we go to calls for service? Some of those calls are more intense than others. Um, and can you, for the listeners, if they don't understand, uh, tap on secondary trauma if you can. So a lot of times people feel like you have to be like intimately involved in a situation uh, to experience trauma. You can witness something from afar or you can just hear a story. I mean, we go to call to call and these are like snippets into other people's lives. And it can be as mundane as, you know, the stereotypical, as people say, the barking dog call. But it can go as far as a horrible car accident. You know, someone can be telling you they got into a huge argument with somebody. OK, well, what started the argument? Well, and they tell you about this tragic thing that happened to them, whether it's a sexual assault or a robbery or just something just really heinous. And when you hear that all day long 
and you don't have a proper outlet. And even when you do have a proper outlet for it, it takes a toll on you. And just like before, uh, when I was speaking about the sleep, if you're not sleeping properly, if you're not getting a chance to really allow your brain to rest and process those those feelings, you begin to take a lot of that stuff on and you get to the point where you become that grumpy officer because you see the world in a very negative way. Because a lot of times we're seeing people on their worst day. And when we take people to jail, you know, they may have committed a crime. And it's one of those things of you're like, man, is everybody like this out here? Like, who are the good people out here? So it, it can take a toll. And I think we dismiss vicarious trauma a lot of times because, again, we tell ourselves, oh, I signed up for this. This is what I'm supposed to do. This this shouldn't bother me. But if it's bothering you, we do need to talk about it. We need we do need to get you to the proper resources and help to be able to process those feelings so it doesn't become the difference between you losing your job, your relationship or your life, which can happen over time. And, you know, for years I worked sex crimes. Uh, I was in that unit for 13 years. So that uh, comes into play with child crimes and adult sex crimes. I did go to a training years ago and uh, addressing secondary trauma. And it was really the first time that I heard that, yes, we do an interview. We then re-listen to that interview because we have to type it. Then we have to review that uh, typed report. And then we have to sometimes go to grand jury over that. And so you were repeating that and repeating that. And that was eye opening for me. And I would like some, I hope that's helpful for a listener to hear in terms of secondary trauma and how often you have to address something that is that can be very tragic. And, um, and so Brad, also, I want you can you go over how those two relate? And if you can, if you can touch on that as well. A lot of my background has been in, in physical health and, and performance. Um, I've been a strength and conditioning coach for several years. And before I started working with the military, I worked with a lot of athletes from high school through college, through professional sports. Um, so I, I have a very intimate knowledge of physical health and, and things like that. And physical and mental health are inextricably, inextricably linked. Um, you can't really separate the two of them. Uh, if you have, you know, if your blood work is bad and your hormones are out of whack and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff, um, or you have heart disease that's going to affect hormone levels, which is going to affect your brain, which is then going to affect, um, your mental health because at the end of the day, your brain is chemistry. And so there's organic chemistry. So if, we don't have the physical side of things and, you know, you're in good health and you, in general, you just feel better and you feel better about yourself if you're fit and healthy. And absolutely. Uh, so you, you can't really separate the two of them at all. Uh, their mental health can affect physical health and physical health can affect mental health. Um, as far as the, the, the secondary and vi or vicarious trauma, a lot of times those two terms are kind of uh, used back and forth. I think the main thing that gets that gets ignored is the cumulative load of it. Of there's, you know, like Lindsay said, a lot of, a lot of officers will, you know, oh, it's what I signed up for. Or, oh, I knew I was getting into that. While that may be true for some, it's not true for others. But even the officers that are, you know, stating, I, I expected this. It's what I kind of signed up for. Uh, I'm sure from your position moving into the the sex crimes unit, you had to have an idea of what you were going to experience. But most people don't. And they're like, you know, well, why did this call mess me up? Or why do why is this call affecting me more than others? But they tend to slice up all their calls into individual calls. And they're not looking at the big picture. And the cumulative load of like you were explaining, seeing the same thing over and over and then the jury and then the reviewing and all that. And then doing that for 13 years. Absolutely. <laughs> and we, we tend to look it's at huge. each call of like, well, that's not that bad. Mm -hmm. why, should, why is that bothering me? Right. Or, well, this call was bad, but I got over that. But we're not keeping track of the cumulative load of all of that over years and years and years in a career. I think that's being missed by a lot of people. Thank you for sharing that. And can we address what are the different types of stress 
that members of various departments deal with. And so I'm wanting to talk about communications. So our 911 call takers, um, all the way down to our records employees. And so our professional staff, as well as our sworn, uh, if we can address what types of uh, different types of stress come into play, even for uh, all of us here. I mean, vicarious trauma. I mean, that secondary trauma right there. I mean, our dispatchers, they're hearing it. A lot of times they don't get the closure that the officer gets because, you know, there are ears, but they're not, you know, we go on to another call just that quickly. And sometimes they don't know how some of these horrible calls ended and um, records, they have to they're pulling reports. They're seeing the pictures uh, now with body cameras. They're seeing some of what we're experiencing on these calls. And then that's just mixed in with their everyday life. They Absolutely. have their own lives. They have their own families. And thank you for for speaking of that, because we do. We we have our own lives mm-hmm. and we can have personal triggers mm-hmm. from something that we've heard. And uh, absolutely. One hundred percent. And just, you know, you have illnesses, you have death in the families or just even at work, there's internal things that go on. You may get a new supervisor that you don't get along with or, you know, just something crazy happens internally and it just kind of rocks you. Rather, it's a illness of an employee, a, the death of an employee, rather it's on duty or due to an illness. So there's all these things that people are dealing with every single day. And sometimes we don't know what people are dealing with. Very true. Brad, do you want to touch on yeah, that? Yeah, I think that I think sometimes we just forget we're dealing with humans Um, and that just because we're in a, you're a police officer or even, even a firefighter or something like that. um, You're, you're a human first. So all of the issues and things and stresses that a norm, uh, uh, someone who's not in law enforcement has in their life, you know, in dealing with your home life or kids or, you know, stress with your spouse or significant other. Uh, and then work, like everyone has stress at work. Like it's not just police officers that have issues with their supervisors, it's everybody. But you take all that normal stress and then you layer on the traumatic stress of the job. And that that takes everything to kind of a whole nother level. Um, so with that in mind, if you, you know, like Lindsay said, records, we're seeing, you're seeing the pictures or in some cases, very gruesome uh, pictures that normal everyday life does not provide to, to people. Um, dispatch, as Lindsay mentioned, they, they tend to start, they start the calls, but they don't ever finish. So it's something akin to like, if you, every day, if you're just reading books and never finishing them and never finishing them and never finishing them. Uh, that that can weigh on them, especially if we end up in calls where, you know, an officer called for assistance or was in an altercation of some kind and all the dispatcher heard was a call for assistance. OK, now we're, we're code for everything's fine, but they don't really know what happened. Like they don't know if an officer was injured or not or what what went on. So and then moving down to the, the officers themselves. Um, and even our community responders and things like that, they're out on the street seeing uh, motor vehicle accidents that might have uh, some pretty gruesome scenes, um, you know, assaults or domestic violence or, you know, uh, homicides and things like that. It's all, it can be very traumatic. It can be. So to help people and listeners who could also be other officers and other professional staff, how can employees prevent having trauma outbursts or having this just your cup flow over? To a certain extent, um, prevention is not really something we can do um, in in this line of work. Um, If you think about trauma, one way to think about it is is a trauma is a event that significantly impacts your brain and your emotional state and overwhelms your ability to cope with it. Um, in the, the it's somewhat unfortunate nature of the job is that officers and even our professional staff will experience that. And so I, I don't think we can, I think if we're, we're looking at complete prevention of experiencing trauma, it's a, it's a game we can't win. So I think we need to look at um, more of a management or a mitigation type strategy 
of we have to accept that that is part of the job that we aren't going to be able to change. Um, so how do we work within that scope and how can we mitigate the effects of those traumatic incidents that that I think should be the focus. Um, and Lindsay alluded to some of this earlier, but having positive, you know, coping strategies or what you, what you might call self-care, um, maintaining some hobbies outside of work, um, that you can do that. You don't have to think about work and things like that. It's a very common theme in law enforcement to come in and based off the schedule or whatever reason, there's, there's a case of, uh, in the words of Dr. Kevin, uh, Gilmartin, the I used us. So I used to do this before I was a, an officer or before I joined the department, I used to play an instrument or I used to play this sport or I used to go do this and now I don't anymore or I used to hunt. Now I don't hunt and trying to roll that back and go back to things that you found enjoyable in life to get outside of the department. Um, I think it's also important to have some social interaction outside of the department. We tend to become very insular and you spend all day at work with officers and people you work with, and then you go home and you spend your off days with those same people. And you don't have that um, social connection outside of the confines of the department, even though you're not physically here, you're still spending time with the same people. And I think that stems from a, when talking about trauma, things like that. It, you, you can't really talk about some of those things with others or they won't, you feel like they won't understand. And there might be some truth that there's probably not as much truth as many think. Um, but that's the, the kind of mental reasoning a lot of people have is that, well, I can't talk about my job with others. They don't understand. So I'm only going to associate with people that understand what I'm doing all day long. And then you become in this little echo chamber. <laughs> um, so getting outside of the department, having some social interaction outside of the department would be a very positive thing for a lot of people. Thank you for bringing validation. So mm -hmm. what I heard from you is that stress is going to be there. So we can't take that away. And sometimes I think when you're very stressed, you feel that nobody can understand you. And so you just brought validation, but really looking at how do we manage it? How do we, um, it's there, but we're not going to deny it because we will ourselves be hurt if we deny that. But um, how can we work through that? And so, and so thank you for validating that. How did you feel as you heard that, Lindsay? Because for myself, that's what I heard. I heard true validation. Right. And I, I just wanted to piggyback on that. Uh, the validation part of what he was saying is we, we have to give ourselves some grace in this line of work. And that's rather you're sworn or you're non-sworn. And I think, uh, like I've said a few times already, we constantly tell ourselves, I signed up for this. But we're humans, just like Absolutely. Brad said, we are humans. And I try to remind people we are humans who wear uniforms. We are humans that wear certain clothing to work every day. And the beautiful thing about clothes is if it gets dirty, you could throw it in the washing machine and it comes out clean and nice. But that doesn't always happen with us. Right. So we have to remind ourselves we're human. We're allowed to feel things. We're allowed to be upset with a call. I mean, sometimes when it's appropriate, we're allowed to shed a tear on a call. Because you are a human, you're not a robot. And if you hold all of that stuff in constantly, it becomes overwhelming. And to Brad's point, we can't prevent, completely prevent trauma on the job. That We would be like some sort of cyborg, I feel like, if we could do that, right? But if we can manage it, if we can remind people, hey, you're a human and you're going to feel these things. And when this event happens, the things that you're feeling, they're perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with you. You're just processing through your brain and your body is processing through this traumatic event and just have resources in place for people. Um, remind people to don't isolate, like Brad was saying. We, we tend to do that. Oh, well, nobody will understand. And it is very easy to look up and everybody that you hang out with is a police officer. But the problem with that is, or in law enforcement, we, we, we can think alike from time to time. So you will be in that echo chamber a lot of times. And 
having a hobby is like one of the best things you can have and something completely not related to police work. People laugh at me sometimes because I learned how to knit when I was in narcotics because the hours were long and you never knew what your schedule was going to be. And surveillance is not the most fun thing to do sometimes. Rather, I was sitting there, I was in the office or when I got home, I needed something to do and reading was not it. I tried that. I would just fall asleep. But knitting, it just it kept my brain active. So just finding little offshoots of things that you can do to keep you active. Go for a hike, you know, get some sun on your skin, sit outside. Meditation doesn't have to be this long. You don't have to be like a, a guru and turn into like a yogi or anything like that. But just sit quietly, listen to a guided meditation. There's a lot of things that we can do to slowly release that valve because we're building up pressure. And I like to remind people that a lot of us take care of our cars better than we take care of ourselves. Absolutely. That you is know, a great point. I so bet you if I was to sit ask. Sit with that, huh? Yeah. yeah. Just, I bet, you know, I, I, but the three of us sitting here, I guarantee um, overall our cars have probably had a more regular appointment yeah. with the mechanic or the dealership than we have with our own physicians. Right. And we take care of our cars. Why? Because we need them to get us from point A to point B. We need us to get from point A to point B because the car isn't going to work if we're not working. We can't get anywhere if we're not working. If we have heart disease, if we have gut issues, if we have migraines all the time, if every time we just we look at a crowd, we're like, oh, people like that doesn't work. So we have to do a better job of slowly but surely offloading and managing the trauma that is going to come our way because unfortunately first responder world, that's the name of the game is trauma. Trauma will find you. And a lot of us are such control freaks. I can admit that. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) And type A personalities that we control everything. Right. But guess what? You don't get to control when your brain releases that trauma. You don't get to control when your brain has had enough and your cup is too full. It could be something as simple as, me knocking over this glass of water right here. And all of a sudden, everything that I've been holding in just comes back to me. And now I'm on the puddle on the floor crying. And you and Brad are like, she just knocked over water. But I'm not showing my traumas aren't written sure. on my shirt. Absolutely. And so that's something we have to give ourselves as human beings in the world of trauma, grace every Absolutely. single day. Absolutely. And with that, I often will share with someone, I'll tell someone, but it's also coming back to me and telling myself to be kinder to myself, to be gentler to myself. But trauma and stress will mess that up in your head. And so I thank you for talking about grace. And um, and so now, Brad, I'm going to put you on the spot. OK, but in a good way, I'm going to ask, can you teach us a couple of de-stressing exercises that we can do actually right now? There's a lot. Um, you can do some breathing exercises. Um, uh, a very uh, common one um, is the Wim Hof method. That's out there. You can go get trained in that. That's become very successful. There's also a component of uh, cold water therapy in that method. Um, but some simple breathing exercises, as simple as just you know taking a, a deep breath in through your nose for four, a four-second breath in, holding it for four seconds and then a six second in exhale hold for four seconds four seconds in and just maybe doing 10 or 20 breaths like that can really activate what's called your parasympathetic nervous system you can think of it as the sympathetic nervous system is that very heightened state of arousal Um, a common uh, way to think about it would be like fight or flight that um, and then your parasympathetic excuse me would be uh, your your rest quote, rest and digest. Uh, so that's where you're sleeping, you're digesting, you're in a much calmer frame of mind. And so a lot of a breathing technique like that can help activate that parasympathetic nervous system and bring you down from that heightened arousal state, help calm you down, um, take you out of that kind of fight or flight mode where you can start getting out of what uh, is referred to as your, your limbic brain or, your, or that reptile brain into your more human brain or in your frontal cortex where you're now actually to think about things logically because all the logic happens up here in the front. Um, and that's part of what makes us human is that, that brain development and the ability to think like that. But the trauma and all those things are injuries to our 
midbrain. Um, and then we can't really control what our midbrain does. It's a very emotional, uh, it's very subconscious and we get sucked into there. Um, and so a breathing technique like that can bring you back out of that into your more aware self where you can make thoughtful, logical decisions about things. Thank you for, for that. And to follow up on that, can you share with us, so you're new here to our family and we are very excited to have you. Can you talk about the programs that are offered? Um, so what programs are offered to officers who are seeking help for their mental health? So we have several and we're always looking, looking to add more. Um, there, without going to maybe a, a, a professional level, and we can get there in a second, um, but we have, as mentioned a couple times this conversation, a peer support team. Uh, so our peer support team is comprised of, we're now at 35 officers and professional staff uh, on that team. They've all gone through a, uh, what's called a critical inc incident stress management training, um, which gives them a training on dealing with someone in, in, in a crisis situation and education on mental health issues, education on, on trauma and education on helping someone process traumatic events post uh, what we call a critical incident. Um, so that's divided into four separate teams. We have a team on call uh, each month. Uh, we have a peer support helpline uh, that can be called uh, at any time, 24 hours a day. It's always manned. So if you needs help, you can call that line and, and get support. And the goal is there, we're providing support from peers. So people that understand what you're going through and have theoretically had experiences similar to yours. Um, beyond that, uh, the, the state has um, the Craig Tiger Act, uh, which is actually an Arizona uh, statute uh, signed into law in, I believe, 2018. Um, in remembrance of Officer Craig Tiger, who was a Phoenix police officer who uh, unfortunately committed suicide after dealing with some mental health issues and PTSD, stemming from a call he experienced at work. And so that allows, there's, there's six different types of qualifying events in, in that statute that allows uh, an officer. The Craig Tiger Act is only for sworn officers. Um, it's also for firefighters as well. Um, but in those six qualifying uh, events, if they experience a call that fits into that criteria, they can fill out a, a form and apply for Craig Tiger benefits, and which will provide at minimum uh, 12 counseling sessions with a counselor of their choice. Um, if it's deemed that you, you or the counselor thinks you need some more time to work things through, you can get up to 36 sessions over the course of one year. So it's either 36 sessions or one year, whichever comes first. Um, and then in addition to that, after meeting with a, with a counselor, um, if it's deemed that you need to take some time away from work uh, to help kind of process and, and deal and, and de-stress, uh, the statute also provides up to 30 calendar days uh, off work uh, where you're, you're paid and, and covered. Thank you for, for sharing that. Lindsay, what I want you to speak about in hearing all of this, you and I are very similar in our time, uh, being a female on the department. And when we first came on, I would say we didn't really address this topic. We didn't have programs set in place. We um, There's so much that today I would welcome a new employee in and say under stress, here are resources that we have. Could you personally speak about the difference that you've seen um, on this topic in law enforcement? Please. Oh, 100%. I mean, I, I came into law enforcement in 2003 and it was very much the rub dirt on it and pour some alcohol on top of that as well. So, I mean, that's kind of how I was raised, so to speak, in law enforcement in the beginning. But over time, I saw how it was affecting me. And I knew myself well enough after certain incidents had occurred to know I needed to go talk to somebody. And so it was very, it was nice being able to walk into my sergeant's office, no judgment. This is what I'm struggling with. And then them hook me up with the peer support team. And that's where my love of the peer support team grew is after my first contact with with peer support. And I knew I was like, OK, so there's other people out here that are going through what I'm going through. And I, I want to remind people 
depending on the size of your agency or just wherever you are in life, it, you don't even have to be in law enforcement. If you're struggling with something, guaranteed five to 10 other people you're walking by every day are going through something similar. And then when you start talking, you're like, oh, wait a minute, Patricia, you, oh, you've had that same thing happen to you after a crazy call. And so I've seen the conversation shift, meaning people will have that conversation. They don't feel so alone. And we have resources. I, I, at my first department, as much as I love my first department, I couldn't tell you who was on the peer support team at my first department. Tempe, I, I know who's on the peer support team. There are some people who are called a lot. The, you, you know, there's a list is easily accessible, which I think is one of the, the things that we do right here is knowing who's on the team. So it's definitely changed. And gents, you know, remembering that we have families at home too. So incorporating our families in these resources and this help, you know, being able to say, hey, uh, I can call Brad and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm working with an employee right now who's, you know, significant other is really struggling with something right now. And Brad can, you know, put us in contact with a therapist or even another team member that may be able to help that, significant other, which is not something I saw in the beginning. And when we're talking about life, something that I've tried to bring to, to the team just because of my own experiences is dealing with our pregnant employees as well. Because, you know, people forget about that part is like, uh, I had to grow a baby and then come back to work, <laughs> you know, and put a gun belt on kind of thing. And we forget about that because I dealt with postpartum depression. And so I'm very vocal about it here at the department. And I like being that person that employees can come to. I'm very open about my experience. I am trying to learn some of the therapists in the area that can talk a family, not just, you know, the mother through this postpartum because it is a family issue. It's not just her issue. So I think that's something that's new and that hadn't been done before. And so I'm I'm very proud of the the progress that we're making. We have a long way to go just in general in our industry, but at least we're having the conversation. I mean, Brad and I were at a wellness conference together last week and a few what last month we were at another one. So like we're actually having like not just a conversation about wellness, we're having full blown trainings, you know, sometimes full blown conferences, you know, three, four days worth of people sharing their stories, resources, inpatient facilities, all this stuff that some people don't even realize exists. So I, I definitely think it's come a long way. And going back to what I said earlier of reminding ourselves and reminding our industry that we are humans. So as far as like where we've come with wellness overall, we're at a point now where we're having full blown conferences. Like I already mentioned, Brad and I have been at a couple of the wellness conferences here recently. And it's just nice to be in a space where other people are going through something similar and you can kind of get feedback from one another and experience resources that you didn't even know were available or different types of programs or um, how another peer support team may be organized compared to your own, you know, because we're all learning and it's regional. Some places are better than others. Some people do different things. Some people are more open to it than other areas. But I'm glad this is where we are, because when I first started policing, none of this was happening. If you even remotely wanted to talk about your feelings, it was almost looked at as being weak. It was. And I, uh, I, I want to thank you for something here and just share um, about, I'd almost take it about two years ago, three years ago, I'm in child crimes. We had just come in from a call out. We had had a child death that had occurred. And Lindsay, you came to my desk and you checked on me. I was at first a little surprised. I thought you needed um, help on a call for service. I thought something else was going on uh, because my brain had not quite registered what had just happened. I had put it in a box somewhere, which I often had to do. And you were very relaxed with me. Uh, you, you asked, do you guys need anything in our unit? Are you okay? You checked on me on that weekend. And really, I could not recall a time that someone had 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 followed through like that, had come to the desk. And, um, and I later, I shared that with my grandmother and she was very impressed and 
and just the growth that we have had on on mental health. So I, I do want to thank you for that very positive seed that you planted. Oh, you are very welcome. I mean, that gives me chills hearing that. I mean, I because I look up to you here at the department and I know you've been through some things and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the person who actually encouraged me to come and see you in person, which is our late friend, Nate Ryberg, uh, which is a very good buddy of mine. And he was like, nope that's an in-person conversation. And he was like, I'll bet you she'll be surprised. You know what I mean? So I truly do. Thank you. Well, I, thank I, you for I that. appreciate that. And so Brad, let's uh, address uh, what other programs are out there for, for employees. Yeah. So as I mentioned, there is the Craig Tiger program. We also have our employee assistance program. Um, and so Craig Tiger is only available to, to sworn officers, but our employee assistance program is available to all employees. Um, and through that, you can call and through an organization called Com- ComPsych, if you call the EAP number and ask for some mental health resources, ComPsych will ask you some questions about what you're, what you're looking for or what you want some help with to kind of focus in on what type of uh, therapist or counselor might best suit your needs. Um, and then they have a network throughout the city that they can uh, set you up with an appointment with a uh, a therapist in the local area that you can then go and start working through so, any uh, mental health problems you might be having or think of it more as a preventative type thing. Just have someone to talk to, to as we mentioned before, prevent and manage some of this trauma you're experiencing. And that's available to everyone in the department. Um, if you have any questions about that, there's also a lot of other nonprofits in the area, both regionally and nationally, that do a very similar thing and will cover part of the cost of, or all of the cost of some, some therapy sessions. Um, EAP is covered by the city. Um, and then obviously insurance, you can use your insurance to, uh, if you'd like to go find on your own and you don't want to deal with the department or department resources in any way, you can use your, your, your health insurance to go. Uh, most health insurances and ours specifically has done a really good job in recent years in adding that uh, coverage to them. Um, but, and, and all these resources, if, if you have questions, reach out to the peer support team. My role, my, the main role I have as the peer support coordinator is to seek out and vet a lot of these resources. But my job is less going to your desk to, to check in on you and see how you're doing. While I do do that for a lot of people, my role is more to find resources and, and provide resources and be a, a resource for the team members if they're working with someone and need access to something, whether it's a, if it's an extreme situation like an inpatient facility. We have uh, some relationships with some inpatient facilities around the country. Um, because a lot of times in that scenario, we don't, we may not want to send you across town because you just need to completely unplug. So we might need to send, have, there's a, in, in Utah and Florida and California, there's places for first responders specifically. Uh, and a lot of those, uh, include a lot of the professional staff that work for us in their umbrella of first responders, because they understand that especially, you know, dispatchers are first responders as well. Absolutely. Um, and so the peer support team has a lot of the resources and knowledge and we can help you get connected with whatever you need. So, Brad, how could we reach out if someone wanted more information? What's your, uh, good contact information for you? Sure. So my email is brad underscore Hollingsworth at Tempe.gov. And for anyone wanting uh, to reach out to our peer support team, um, our peer support 24-7 helpline number is 480-757-HELP. Uh, so you can call that and at any seven days a week, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, uh, we have a member of the peer support team manning that phone line and they can provide you any amount of peer support um, resources. If it's a, you need members of the team to respond to uh, a situation, you can call that number and that'll get a hold of us and activate a call out for the team. Or if it's just simply calling because you're you want us to check in on another employee in the department, feel free to call the helpline. Uh, let it kind of inform us as to what's going on, and then we can take it from there and and 
reach out and make contact and provide any resources that that employee might need. Perfect. Thank you for that. And Lindsay, I'm going to ask you, how important is perspective and having the right people to talk to for the healing process? That's huge. Um, Having the right people to talk to can be the difference between someone sharing and not. And so part of the team, a big part of our team is confidentiality. You know, people have to know that when they come and talk to us, we're not going to be blabbing it around the water cooler as we talk about what game we watched last night or what show we watch. It has to stay with that person or with the team, because if you don't have that confidentiality, honestly, you don't have a team and you have to have the right people on the team, too, because if you have people that have messy lives on the team, nobody's going to want to talk to that person because it's like, well, how can I go to you to help me not solve my problem, but sort through my problem yes. when all of your business is in the street at the department. So you have to be very careful with that, with the team and just, you know, having different types of people on the team that are relatable. Um, I'm not saying that you, everybody on the team has to go through like these big, crazy, critical incidents, but just different life experiences can mean a lot. Being a parent, not being a parent, having somebody on the team that has lost a parent um, or who has been through certain critical incidents or come from other industries where you can have that conversation because it is a lot easier to talk to somebody who you feel like you see a little bit of yourself in and they totally understand it. Like, you know, if you've never been through certain things, I'm not saying you can't help me, but it's not going to be as easy if I come to you after a critical incident and you've never been through a critical incident. The The want is there to help. I've been that person. Yes. But then you go through your own critical incident and then for whatever weird reason in our line of work, that's where the credibility comes in. Oh, you've been damaged. Yes. Now I can talk yes. to you yes. about about yes. what has damaged me. So having the right person on the team is like, I mean, it, it can make or break a team and it can make or break that person's situation with getting help. Thank you for that, Lindsay. And as we are getting ready to wrap up and close, can you uh, talk to me, Brad, about the goals for the future of the police department and the wellness program? The main goal is to grow our wellness program and provide more resources um, Traditionally, uh, the, the main resource for wellness for the police department has been the peer support team. Uh, my goal, and I think the goal of the department as well, is to grow those resources to beyond just the peer support team. So maybe adding some more resources for physical health, uh, adding other resources for mental health or injury prevention or injury recovery. Uh, we're currently working on building out what we're at this time, we're in the very early stages, so things may change. But what we're calling the the pillars of, of Tempe Wellness. And so the idea there is to define what our wellness program is going to look like in the future. And so some of the things we're, we're looking at right now are, you know, to focus on would be a, a physical, a physical piece, a mental piece, uh, family which we think is very important, but we don't necessarily have a ton of resources focused on family at the time, at this time. And so we're going to look to include some more resources uh, to help the families of our employees out. And then also looking at uh, our values. So, you know, our character and our spirituality, things like that, uh, which some of those might, are integrity. Uh, A lot of those have uh, a really big effect on uh, your mental, your mental health, um, and just your, your health overall and your general well being in, in life. Uh, so that's our main push there, uh, within that, um, just trying to continue to build our peer support team and bring, bring them more education, more training, add some different elements, uh, to Lindsay's point about having the right people on the team. Uh, one thing I think we are lacking at this time is we don't have any spouses on the team. And so that's something I want to look into moving forward is how can we go about including some spouses on the team the right way with the right amount of uh, vetting and making sure that they're, they're the right fit. Um, but then hopefully we can then have some peer support uh, representation and, and support for families beyond just internal employees. So just a few of the things we're working on. I love those goals. Mm-hmm. Those are, those are great. Thank you. So as we're wrapping up, I just want to thank you for 
all of us here for being vulnerable, for being honest, and for addressing such an important topic. So thank you for your time. Thank you. It's glad thank, to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. And we're glad we get to sit and talk about something that we're both pretty passionate about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you.